Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Farm Foundation Forum, What to Expect from the 2023 Farm Bill. We're glad to, to have this opportunity to engage with you today and are very thankful to Farm Credit for their support of this forum. My name is Tim Brennan. I'm the Vice President of External Relations here at Farm Foundation. We're located just outside of a very cold and foggy Chicago, Illinois this morning. I'm looking forward to today's discussion on the direction of the upcoming Farm Bill will potentially take and the factors influencing its development. But before we get into today's, into today's program, I'm going to take just a few moments to share a bit more about Farm Foundation. We are a nearly 90-year-old 501c3 nonprofit organization working at the intersection of agriculture and society to address the challenges that detect, uh, affect the entire food and ag value chain. Specifically, we're an accelerator of practical solutions for agriculture, accelerating both people and ideas into action. The three levers we use to accomplish this are policy, innovation, and education. Forums such as today's are just one part of our extensive program of work, which is guided by our mission to build trust and understanding at the intersections of agriculture and society, and our vision to build a future for farmers, our communities, and our world. We rely on partnerships to fund our work and to increase our impact. So if you're interested in learning more about funding or partnering with us, I invite you to reach out to explore collaboration and you can email me directly at tim at farmfoundation.org. I'd like to take a moment to highlight our new program we just started called Friends of Farm Foundation. When you enroll as a friend, not only will you be helping support the mission and vision of Farm Foundation, but you'll also gain some really great benefits, such as first reads of our issue reports, some networking opportunities, and much more. Being a friend is an investment in building a better future for farmers, our communities and our world. And I have to say, they make a great Christmas gift. Uh, to learn more about being a friend uh, of Farm Foundation, go to farmfoundation.org slash friends. And we're gonna go ahead and post that link in the chat function so you can click right on it and sign up for it this morning. In addition to learning more about Farm Foundation and our work by visiting our website, I encourage you to connect with us on all of our social media platforms. And please note, if you're posting on social media about this morning's very exciting session, we ask that you please use hashtag Farm Foundation Forum. So I have a few more last minute housekeeping notes. Uh, there will be an audience question answer session at the end, usually the most uh, exciting part of the discussion. We'll be using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, not the chat, to queue questions. The form is being recorded and we will post it on our website at farmfoundation.org as well as on our YouTube channel. And we'll send out a link to you following today's program and we encourage you to share that in your own networks and on social media. Uh, when the forum concludes, you'll also receive a link for a brief survey. We really appreciate your feedback and time in completing that survey. Now, let's turn to today's forum topic, the upcoming Farm Bill. Uh, it's on all of our minds and uh, everyone is talking about it, so we're really excited uh, to take the next two hours to talk about it. And we have an outstanding panel of experts joining us today, and we're so grateful that they can join us to share their very wise insights. It's my pleasure to introduce our moderator and discussion leader, Spencer Chase. Spencer is the managing editor of AgriPulse. He serves as the host of AgriPulse Newsmaker, a weekly show focused on ag policy, and produces AgriPulse Drive Time, a daily podcast of key events. Spencer also currently serves as the president of the National Association of Farm Broadcasting and is a frequent guest on radio programs focused on food and ag policy issues. Spencer, thank you so much for moderating our forum today. Well, thank you for having me, Tim, and thank you to the folks at the Farm Foundation for organizing this event, and I appreciate uh, our panelists who will meet here in just a little bit for their time uh, this week as well as we continue our discussion on what the upcoming Farm Bill will look like, the politics, the policies, uh, all, all of the underlying issues that will be faced uh, as Congress looks to update and reauthorize that 2018 Farm Bill. Will it happen? in 2023 or will it uh you know, will a friend of mine who has uh, 50 bucks on 2025 uh, end up doubling his money uh, a lot of things to discuss here uh, as we continue our conversation and i thought i'd just frame it
Farm Bill was in the summer of 2013. And uh, at that time, I was an intern with AgriPulse Communications and uh, was uh, on the third day of my internship and was covering House Farm Bill markup there in 1300 uh, Longworth and I think 13 over 1301. I ended up in the, the spillover room for a minute there, uh, but uh, had the opportunity to sit in on that, uh, watch kind of the uh, the masterful markups from the days of Frank Lucy, Lucas and Colin Peterson at the uh, chair and ranking uh, slots of the House Ag Committee. I'm sure that's bringing back uh, either good or terrifying members for, for some on this uh, forum, depending on your perspective. But uh, watch that uh, markup up run and I think at about 11 55 p.m uh my my co-worker looked over at me and said you're an intern why are you still here your metro is going to not work uh here too long uh, if you if you stick around and so uh really that was my my first foray into farm bill politics and it's been uh, a similar ride ever since just keeping an eye on the the various politics the various policies that are in play uh watching the machinations of the 2013 bill uh covering the 2018 bill after I had come on full time with Agripol and following the implementation of both of those pieces of legislation. And so it's it's been an interesting ride and obviously a, a lot of topics to be discussed here today from folks far more experienced uh, than I in the subject. And, and I want to turn to our first uh, speaker who regrettably was not able to join us here uh, today, but did pass along some virtual remarks that we will get to here in just a second. Uh, going to be speaking or uh, hearing soon uh, from Congressman Glenn G.T. Thompson, a Pennsylvania Republican poised to become the chair of the House Agriculture Committee uh, once the Republicans uh, officially take over that chamber in the House of Representatives, currently serves as the ranking member of the committee, as well as the representative of Pennsylvania's 15th district in the House of Representatives, also a senior member on the Education and Labor Committee. Uh, the Congressman regrets that he was not able to join us live, but he did pass along some virtual remarks, uh, some pre-recorded remarks, and so we will turn to those now. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to speak at this year's Farm Foundation Forum. For those who don't know me, I'm Congressman G.T. Thompson, proud representatives for Pennsylvania's 15th Congressional District and Republican leader of the House Agriculture Committee. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there with you today, but I'm thankful for the opportunity to speak to you about agriculture's impact across the globe. As the 118th Congress nears, we have three options for the upcoming Farm Bill. Let it expire pass an extension, or craft a bill that works for all farmers, ranchers, producers, and foresters nationwide. Of course, this is predicated on bipartisanship and the will of the House and Senate. Now, I'm dedicated to working with my colleagues, agriculture advocates, and farm families to ensure that we get the job done. Now, while we have laid some groundwork, it is imperative we do much more in the new year. Over the last several months, I've heard from producers across the nation about the issues they face, from rising input costs and diesel shortages to fractured supply chains and historic inflationary pressures. We must take action to mitigate the significant headwinds currently hampering production of an abundant and affordable food supply. Earlier this year, I was proud to introduce H.R. 8069, the Reducing Farm Input Costs and Barriers to Domestic Production Act which would reverse many of the more harmful regulatory actions spearheaded by this administration. It would address escalating input costs and provide certainty to farmers, ranchers, agribusinesses, and other entities across our food and ag supply chains. American agriculture, if given the right tools and regulatory confidence, can expand its vital role in alleviating global food instability and reducing costs for consumers. Additionally, the need for a reliable farm safety net is paramount. Nearly 80% of the federal funding to producers since 2018 has come from outside the Farm Bill baseline, largely due to inefficient, costly disaster relief. These ad hoc programs have provided necessary assistance, but farmers can't plan for them and lenders can't depend on them. Well, that's why we need to enhance the farm safety net provisions in the Farm Bill to provide more long-term certainty and reduce the need for ad hoc assistance. Another issue I know that weighs heavily on the minds of producers is access to a legal, reliable, year-round workforce. No sector has been harmed more by our broken immigration system than agriculture. Though it is far from perfect, 
I voted in support of the Farm Workforce Modernization Act, a bill that aims to address this very issue. Now, I remain hopeful this bill will be refined through the legislative process to better support America's farmers and ranchers. Again, I'd like to thank you all for the work you do on behalf of American agriculture and for giving me the opportunity to provide a few comments. I look forward to seeing you in the new year. God bless. Once again, our thanks to Congressman Thompson for providing those remarks. Uh, would have been great to hear from him in person, but always uh, great to hear from Congressman Thompson uh, on a video recorded uh, format as well. Want to now turn to the three panelists that we will be uh, hearing from throughout the course of today's forum, uh, both in their presentations uh, to kick things off, as well as later on in a question and answer session that, uh, that I will moderate and will encourage your participation in as a member of this audience through that Q&A function. Uh, but uh, before we get to that point, let's hear some presentations. And the first one we will hear comes from Chuck Connor, the president and CEO of the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives. Chuck's been in that role since 2009, and he oversees the organization's work to promote and protect the businesses and public policy interests of America's farmer-owned co-ops. Prior to that time, prior to joining NCFC, Chuck has a, a career in farm policy spanning many decades in many different positions, including uh, the Deputy Secretary at the Department of Agriculture, uh, where he was beginning in 2005, also led the development of the George W. Bush administration's $300 billion farm bill proposal, and played a key role in developing the administration's immigration policy, including important changes to the H-2A program. His experience also includes the assignment of Special Assistant to the President Executive Office of the President from October 2001 to May of 2005, where in that role he worked out the 2001 and 2002 Farm Bill to develop the strategy behind the transfer of several USDA functions to the newly formed Department of Homeland Security. Before joining USDA, Chuck served on Capitol Hill as well as the President of the Corn Refiners Association. Chuck, thanks for joining us. Excited to hear your comments. Spencer, uh, thank you, and um, I appreciate this opportunity, and to Morgan and Tim, thanks for all of your work in uh, getting this farm foundation event organized that I'm uh, thrilled to participate in. Let's talk about the uh, upcoming farm bill, and uh, farm bills are always such an important piece of legislation in terms of the future direction of uh, farm and food policy in this country, and this, is, this one will be no different, and as I uh, begin a farm bill process and sort of assessing where we need to be. I think for me, the fundamental question is always kind of what, what is the climate for the farm bill? And is this a farm bill where we really ought to be looking at revolutionary changes or, or perhaps evolutionary or, or you know maybe something in between? And a lot of factors go into that. We don't often do revolutionary farm bills. We did one and I would describe the 85 bill, for example, and maybe the 96 bill was certainly probably the most revolutionary farm bill. But uh, oftentimes, if things are okay out there in farm country and farmers seem to be fairly comfortable, um, oftentimes, you know, we just um, tweak around the edges and, and, you know, work hard to try and get it done and delivered on time. And I think it's probably a little early to tell in terms of the farm bill. Prices are pretty good, generally speaking, but we're coming off a lot of drought and we're coming off high input prices. And I, th I think it's kind of yet to be determined whether this is a revolution or, or perhaps uh, something else, if you will. The slide before you now is um, just to remind folks uh, that are tuning in here that uh, a farm bill is, is not just about farm programs and it's not just about um, the um, nutrition programs, uh, with it, you know, it, it really is much more extensive uh, than that. It really covers virtually everything and every function performed by the Department of Agriculture, as you can see from the, the 12 titles of the bill. And again, we tend to focus on titles one and four, commodities and nutrition, but there's a whole lot going on in this farm bill that uh, uh, is also very, very important to the, the future of American agriculture and will play a key role in, uh, in just how easily and how quickly we can get this next bill done. Next slide, if you would, please. Um, I'm going to start out on a positive note, uh, you, you know, just on this whole question of this is a tough bill. It's always been a tough bill to get done. You know, give me some hope, Chuck, that, that in this kind of po divided political environment that we're in, uh, Republican House, Democratic Senate, uh, Democratic uh, White House, how are we going to sort through all this? Do we have a chance at getting a comprehensive 12 title bill done? 
And I will tell you, I think the best chance we've got is based upon this slide in front of you. And these are the four individuals that will have the biggest impact uh, on uh, this bill. Um, I think most of you probably know, but in the top you have uh, David Scott on the top left, who is the current chairman, will soon be the ranking member on the House Agriculture Committee. We just heard from G.T. Thompson, the new incoming chairman of the House Agriculture Committee. Lower left is Senator Debbie Stabenow. She has been the longtime either chairman or the ranking member of the House Agriculture or of the Senate Agriculture Committee. And then, of course, John Bozeman, who will be the ranking member uh, in this Congress on the Senate Agriculture Committee. I do this because, folks, these are four very, very experienced legislators. Uh, they have been around this track many, many times, uh, particularly in the Senate with Stabenow and Bozeman. I mean, this is just a very, very seasoned squad. You know, if, if, if you're, uh, you know, down to the final two minutes, these are the people you want on the floor, you know, representing you. And it just gives me hope and optimism that through the work and the bipartisan work of these four individuals and their experience, that despite very, very difficult odds, we, we stand a reasonably good chance at getting a good farm bill delivered on time because of, of simply who is, um, you know, representing us in this process. Next slide, if you would, please. On a less optimistic note, I will just tell you that um, here's what I see as being, uh, being you know, the, the roadblock that's going to have to be overcome. In the early farm bills that I worked on in the early 1980s, uh, the nutrition programs accounted for, you know, somewhere around 14 to 16 percent of the total cost of the farm bill. And as you can see from this spending pattern, our current bill, those same nutrition programs are up 76 percent. The projected next farm bill, that number goes all the way up to 84 percent for one program, the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program and everything else in the bill, all other 11 titles, basically kind of divide up a relatively small piece of the pie, as you see uh, reflected here. Now, I can see this being a source of a lot of conflict, and this is not a news flash for those of us who work on, on farm and food policy, but uh, there's going to be a real attempt to increase conservation, to increase some of the support levels for the commodity programs because those, those levels are so low compared to current market prices and compared to the current cost of production. But, you know, where's that money going to come from? Can you take some of that out? Of, you know, to, to get the money, you sort of have to go where the money is. And you can sort of see the obvious question, this is where the money is. And of course, this creates an enormous divide here. You know, can you get uh, any votes uh, in the, the House and Senate Democratic Caucus and touch the nutrition programs? I think that's an open question. But can you get enough votes without doing more on some of these other initiatives as well? And, hit, you know, this creates the conflict. We're sort of locked into this. We can't touch anything, but everybody needs a little bit more. And, and I just, again, stating the obvious for many of us, this if, if we had the answer to this question right here and represented by these uh, cost distributions, we would have a pretty good idea of, of our chances of getting the bill done in a timely way. Let's just go on quickly to the next, uh, uh, next slide. Uh, again, as you can see, uh, this is sort of what I think is going to drive and shape the debate. Um, Conservation, uh, Title II of the bill. This is this is a really, really important uh, title for us as we really begin to talk about agriculture in, in a somewhat different way than what we have in, in, in past farm bills, just in terms of doing all that we can to help farmers meet the challenges that they face in terms of, you know, producing as much as they can with the least amount of footprint that they can. And I would just say maybe what's a little bit different about this farm bill is, is whether it's the, the conservation title or just the overall context of the farm bill. The world is really watching what we're going to be doing here in terms of this whole climate regenerative agricultural debate and how we partner, if you will, with our producers and our farmers out there to really sort of do it as well as we possibly can. And again, this is not an isolated debate just within the farm community. Our own consumers are watching it. Our own food companies, as I'm sure others on this panel will, will, will discuss, are, are really honing in on this. Now, I, I would also, I've talked a little bit already about uh, nutrition versus farm programs. This goes to the heart of urban versus rural 
uh, out there and the impact that that is going to have on our farm bill debate. You know, the, the rural constituency in the House, uh, it's a relatively small group of people out there. You can't do a farm bill with just rural voters in the House of Representatives, and certainly that's, that's true in the Senate. You know, it's got to be not only bipartisan, but you've got to have urban and rural interests come together in order to have a reasonable bill. I'll just mention cost briefly as well. I don't know what the cost context is going to be on this bill yet, and that makes it a little hard to predict. Um, some would argue that, you know, Congress, neither party has been in any way cost conscious over the last several years, and I would agree generally with that statement. We have spent a whole lot of money that we didn't have. And is that going to change in 2023, or will they basically just say spend what you want in the farm bill? My sense is it's going to be more of a austere kind of farm bill where at least some reasonable minds are going to say, look, we have throughout COVID, we have spent a ton of money uh, in this country. Our deficit is, is at staggering levels that the Federal Reserve is having trouble even digesting. This is going to need to be an austere farm bill, and that's going to make our challenge all the more as we divide up uh, those resources uh, going forward. So all of this in the next slide is basically a way of me saying, you know, what are our chances of getting this done in 2023? Um, as I've said, I feel optimistic only because we are putting the most seasoned legislators that we have in a very, very long time on the field or on the court, if you will, to get this done. I have tremendous confidence in, the, for example, in the likes of uh, John Bozeman and Debbie Stabenow. They're just there, there, there's nobody better at putting together coalitions to, to pass tough legislation. Again, I put the House uh, members in the same category as well, particularly G.T. Thompson, because you know we all know it's going to be a, a real slog in the House to sort of keep the hard right satisfied, but yet bring along some Democratic members. G.T. Thompson, I believe, is the guy that can do that. He, he can keep the hard right in line but yet reach out uh, across the aisle and bring others. And so it does make me a little bit optimistic, uh, but there's, a, there's you know heavy, heavy lifts in front of us. And I'll close out by just focusing what I know the other three panelists are gonna talk quite a bit about, and that is just the importance of the conservation title uh, in this bill. I have said on many, many occasions that I believe that this farm bill that we're debating in 2023 will need to be able to carry a label as the most climate friendly bill that we have ever passed you know, in the Congress in terms of, of agriculture. And I still believe that is to be the case. As I pointed out here in this slide, I think the question for us is how do you go about doing that? Is it through incentives like we have used in the past, cost share technical assistance? Is it through denying of uh, subsidies and payments like we have done some in the past with Sod Buster and Swamp Buster? Or do we just flat out say, go the mandate route and say, you know, farmers, you shall do this kind of thing. Um, certainly, I hope, you know, I join a lot of American agriculture and hoping it's not this uh, third option. I believe we have solved a lot of problems in American agriculture using uh, incentives uh, and uh, cost share. I believe that this is... Uh, can be done also in the climate space and uh, the Food and Ag Climate Alliance, which I am an active member of, I think is gonna be playing a real key role there, uh, not only in, in the bill in general and how climate friendly it is, but certainly all of this money that has been provided in the Infl Inflation Reduction Act, which will need to be sort of allocated and figured out as part of the farm bill as well. So thank you all. Thank you, Chuck, for those comments, for that perspective on uh, where farm bills have been and where you think this one might be going. Very useful context as we head our way into uh, our next speakers uh, and joined now by Jonathan Coppas and Chris Adamo, uh, authors of a recent Farm Foundation issue report on the upcoming farm bill. Uh, you can find that issue report on the Farm Foundation's uh, website, but now by way of introduction of our speakers. Uh, Jonathan Coppice is the director of the Gardner Agriculture Policy Program and an associate professor of law and policy in the Department of Agricultural and Consumer Economics at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I got to imagine that's a lot of text to fit on a business card. My, my condolences to you on that, Jonathan. Uh, prior to joining the university, Jonathan served as the chief counsel for the U.S. Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry, uh, administrator of the Farm Service Agency at the Department of Agriculture, and as a legislative assistant to U.S. Senator Ben Nelson. 
Also uh, volunteered with the Biden-Harris presidential transition, the agency review team for USDA, and as a part-time special counsel to the Senate Ag Committee. Before his time in Washington, Jonathan practiced law in Chicago. Also joining us is Chris Adamo, the Vice President for Public Affairs and Regenerative Agriculture Policy at a consumer packaged food and beverage company here in Washington. Uh, previously was a Chief of Staff for the White House Council on Environmental Quality during the Obama administration, where he helped lead the President's agenda on climate change and conservation. Before that, he was the Staff Director for the Senate Agriculture Committee, uh, where he led negotiations and drafting of the 2014 Farm Bill, which included new opportunities for landscape-scale conservation investments in healthy foods. Chris began his Senate career in 2005 and was a legislative counsel in Senator Debbie Stabenow's office starting in 2007, where he worked on priorities such as the 07 Energy Bill, the 08 Farm Bill, and eventually the 2009 and 2010 Energy and Climate Bill efforts, as well as various other things that I'm sure kept you plenty busy during those times, Chris. Uh, but for now, I'm going to make myself scarce and turn things over to Chris and Jonathan. Thanks for joining us. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Spencer. Um, thank you, Tim and Morgan and Martha and Sherry and the team at Farm Foundation for having us on this and a, and a chance to uh, to talk through some farm bill and gain some wisdom from folks like Chuck Connor as well. So this is this is good and excited to do uh, uh, to be a part of this discussion. Maybe even Chris and I can argue again, like like we used to do when we had to work together. Uh, on I would not days. expect anything less, Jonathan. Agreement would not be fun. <laughs> so a little bit about this report that Tim or that Spencer mentioned that, uh, that Chris and I worked on uh, for Farm Foundation. And it was a lot of fun because they sort of presented to us. And, and, I, and Chuck kicked this off just right by asking kind of the same question. You know, what would a revolutionary farm bill look like? What, what kind of things can we think through early in the process? You know, food for thought before we get into all the nitty gritty uh, details and scoring estimates and the wonderful political going on uh, for a farm bill authorization debate. So Chris and I uh, used that as a good brainstorming session to, to think about, all right, what, what would revolutionary farm bill look like? So we wanted to start because you know we, we, we both are recovering attorneys and we got to define these things just right. So we, we came up with our definition of the three kind of categories of farm bills. The status quo, as, as Chuck even mentioned, you know, these are the most common um, we're tinkering around the edges, not making a lot of change. Uh, evolutionary, we can think of in terms of some significant and substantive changes to a farm bill, but really kind of in a, in a general direction or trend. We're, we're not upending things. We're not pivoting to different um, outcomes or, or uh, directions and trends in, in the policy. And then we have our revolutionary concept, which is, look, this is, this is one of those moments when um, a variety of forces come into play and we see a significant change in policy. Uh, programs are eliminated, new programs created, and a different sort of trend line is established for where that policy develops and evolves from there. Uh, so Morgan, if you jump in the next one. This was our attempt then to break down uh, the wonderfully long history of farm bills. And, and, and as a, as a, as a self-professed history geek, um, I love to sort of put this in context. If Congress pulls this off next year in 2023, it will mark the 90th anniversary since the most revolutionary farm bill of all time, which is the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1933. So we could be uh, looking at quite an anniversary if this can get done next year. In addition, you know, there's probably two other really revolutionary farm bills. Um, the first one being uh, the 73 Act, mostly because of the combination of uh, the addition of food stamps, so bringing in the Food Assistance Coalition for low-income families, and the big shift from the sort of old New Deal parity system of farm support to this target price income supporting payment system uh, that we're much more familiar with now. So 73, major change. And then, of course, as Chuck mentioned, 96, uh, the, the, the FAIR Act, the Federal Agriculture Improvement and Reform Act, which upended the farm payment system uh, and really pushed it into this decoupled um, decoupled trend that we're still on for farm programs and the direct payments. And then you got to give uh, you got to give kind of an honorable mention to the 85 Act, and particularly with all of our focus on conservation and other issues, um, because that is the foundation of the conservation uh, programs today. 
every program, every amendment, every change is written as an as a as a change or an amendment to the 1985 Act based text. So it didn't bring about anything too revolutionary in terms of farm program payments or in terms of the food assistance programs, but it did launch conservation. So we we gave that an honorable mention. Uh, and then you can just see some of the others there, some of the more evolutionary trends than our, our, our status quo. Um, for those of you, I, I think the next slide just kind of, uh, oh, this is the image from the report and there's the link to the report, but I think you've got that in the, uh, in the chat box as well. And with that, Chris, uh, maybe you wanna hit on some of the trends and kind of tee that, that part of the, the discussion up a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Jonathan. And maybe just one quick commentary of my own of the the evolutionary or the, the trifecta of different farm bills there that Jonathan just laid out. I, I want to put out there that I think it is very, um, well, an e relatively easy argument to make that in some of those evolutionary and status quo farm bills, there still were bits of innovation, po innovative policy within. So just because something didn't make the revolutionary bucket doesn't mean there wasn't something highly meaningful. And I'm not just saying that because I personally wasn't a part of any of those revolutionary farm bills. Um, but obviously, if you go back and look at just within my time of being around from 2002, 2008, 14, and even 18, those last four farm bills alone, we can all go through and comb out different um, innovative policies, right, that have been for whatever sets of reasons, uh, disruptive in their own right, and, and in some cases, highly successful. So with that, why did those bits of innovations come about? Why are these different pushes being made? I think we have to think about a number of the trends, and these trends are not static, right? Every farm bill, I think, has its own host of trends that uniquely um, act as drivers to push different policy conversations. I mean, first and foremost, obviously, are world markets on commodities, commodity prices, and, and where those are going. How is that how are those prices impacting farmers at home? That's usually one of the first things we think about when we think about any major uh, driver of farm bills. But over the last 15, 20 years, we've really seen a number of other motivating forces come into farm bills. And first and foremost, just consumer awareness um, of food in general and various parts of the food value chain starting to enter into the farm bill debates. Local and regionalized foods, and, and we use that very broadly, how, who, who these people are, who, how they work, what their interests are, I think are highly diverse. Um, it's, it's quite a large group and may depend on the region and area we're talking about. But the Farm Bill has started to represent these different ideas in different titles, um, whether it's a specialty crop title, whether it's um, research, whether it's conservation, regional localized foods uh, trends have started to show up in a number of different places. The organic food industry has obviously seen a lot of growth since it's um, federal inception going back to when the program, well, the program was codified in 1990, but, but it took about a decade to get the regulations up and running. So really looking at about 22 years of existence at a federal, as a federal standard and going back to 2008 and then all the way to 2018, we've seen a number of different organic policies start to solidify their place in farm bills. Um, diversity inclusion, diversity, equity inclusion. I mean, this has been a topic that is very hot over the last couple of years, but it's not new either. If we think back to the 2008 Farm Bill, uh, we had a number of issues even starting there um, in a number of different pieces and, and certainly something that will likely continue for, for years to come. Climate change, obviously a very hot topic right now uh, in a lot of different uh, ways. It, we saw it, and we'll talk about this more, but we saw it come up in the Inflation Reduction Act, which impacted farm bill spending, um, but, but obviously is something that is being felt uh, as a pressure and driver across the value chain in a number of different ways. And then I think the, the last bullet there, sorry, my screen is uh, cutting it off. I'm not sure what's happening here, Zoom. Um, but you know, I think overall, we just see a larger constituency starting to show up at farm bills over the last 20 plus years. I mean, Jonathan and I certainly felt it in our time in Capitol Hill. Uh, I know that this is this is more than just about farmers at the end of the day. It's about consumers. It's about a number of folks within the food uh, industry overall. Um, maybe next slide, please. And this is just a quick, you know, breakout of who some of these people are. You know, we talk about it as special interest. We talk about it as uh, different constituencies, whatever term you apply. These are people at the end of the day with very interests. And, and we talk, and traditionally there are groups, um, obviously farm growing groups, first and foremost, are a core constituency we think about. Hunger groups are another core constituent, 
constituency we think about with farm bills. But this list has really been growing with those trends, with those drivers expanding over the years and those new policies that show up. We're seeing new people at the table, um, really, even through these evolutionary and, and status quo farm bills over the last couple of years. Next slide, please. Jonathan, I'm going to hand this one back over to you if you want to walk us through some of your fancy maps. <laughs> so uh, all of these are borrowed uh, as as perfect for an academic. Um, so I think that's a good, you know, Chris kind of set up the, the constituency issues and the trends. And so when we were, you know, when we were chewing over what kind of a revolutionary farm bill we might get to see or what might come about, you know, obviously the topic that we figured you know, the most likely driver, right? These revolutionary farm bills, whether it's 73, 96, 85, they're driven by um, a variety of factors in society, in our politics. And so, you know, it, as Chuck mentioned, climate change um, is, if we're going to drive a revolutionary farm bill this time around, climate change is likely the reason. Uh, it, its impacts on agriculture already being felt in many parts of the country, and the, the projections are obviously difficult. Morgan, we can jump through this uh, to the next one. And it, when we think about climate change and farm policy, obviously we're thinking about risk. Here's just the RMA maps of indemnities uh, the last couple of years. More than anything, a reminder that our policies are, are built around, particularly crime, uh, uh, crop insurance, built around the risk factors and the challenges at the farm level for producing food and, and fiber and fuel and other substances through this. So as we see climate change impact, it is going to, uh, it's going to hit policy no matter what. And that, uh, I guess, really puts the pressure on those of us who, who work and think through this about what our policies uh, may need to look like how we may need to adjust these things going forward, given that reality. So we we pick climate change as our most likely driver, um, and then we wanted to focus in on. Uh, if you jump to the next slide, and this this really feeds off what Chuck set up, which is the budgetary challenges. And and, and as we can attest, uh, Chris and I both lost a lot of sleep uh, over these farm bill efforts, in large part because what is driving the political discussion, what may drive the revolutionary change, climate change, these outside forces in society and, and, and around the world, are not the things that drive the writing of a farm bill. And unfortunately, so much of what we have done uh, in, in Congress the last, frankly, 40 years or so has been built around this budget concept. And so everything a farm bill does now works through and is driven by or is or sort of confined to uh, the budgetary estimates. So what we have in front of us is the most recent May 2022 baseline by the Congressional Budget Office. This is the space, the spending space in which the Ag Committees have to work. And Chuck mentioned this as well. If you want to increase in one of these blocks, you got to cut from somewhere else. You got to come out at your baseline. And it is a zero-sum game in which if we consider Congress a coalition building effort and that success requires that broad-based coalition to get through um, both chambers of, Converse, uh, of Congress and to the president, this kind of thing really pits interest groups against each other. And Chuck mentioned it as well, you know, are we going to cut this to help pay for that, which complicates our ability, uh, our politics and our ability to write, write farm bills. So while we may have revolutionary pressure, if you will, from a climate change uh, set of issues, we are stuck in our baseline scenario with farm uh, with farm policy and with the farm bill authorization process. And Chuck noted it as well. SNAP and the supplemental uh, the supplemental nutrition Pro assistance program in Title IV and other assistance programs for food for low income families are really the big um, spending item in a farm bill. But that's also part of our problem with this budgetary discussion is because it does leave out, to Chris's point, the constituents. We're also talking about 40 million Americans getting assistance from this program. So yes, it is a big dollar item, but it is a huge constituency. And it is a constituency that spreads from inner city, low income neighborhoods to very poor rural communities as well. So it is not, it crosses all that rural and urban divide and it provides food assistance to Americans and families who, who simply need the help to put food on the table which is ultimately customers and constituents of farmers and agriculture as well. So when we get stuck on the budget, we miss some of the key aspects for the people involved in the programs. And frankly, there's the just sheer size 
of the constituency base in these programs. And of course, then we, we can compare crop insurance, conservation and commodities, which is all directed at the farm sector and is certainly a much smaller constituent base. So the spending is not insignificant on those programs. If we jump to the next one, I'll run through these kind of quickly. Our Title I programs, the agriculture risk coverage, price loss coverage is the biggest dollar item in the Title I space. We also help obviously dairy farmers and we have some disaster assistance in there. And these are counter cyclical, so they run uh, based on prices. If prices are high and revenues are strong, you're not going to see the spending. So much of what CBO is going to look at next year will be that forecast around prices and revenues, and that's going to drive how much it sits in that baseline. Um, if we jump to the next slide, we can look at the conservation programs all the way from the, uh, the traditional conservation reserve program um, recreated in 85 that's been around for many, many years uh, with uh, reserving acreage uh, from production into a conservation purpose. And then more of our, our focus on things like working lands conservation through conser the CSP Conservation Stewardship Program, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, and of course the Regional Conservation Partnership Program that was created as one of those innovative places in, a, in an otherwise evolutionary farm bill of 2014. And then I wanna jump to the next one, the, the next two here relatively quickly, as mentioned, we, because we're in this baseline scenario, we're not going to see additional funding uh, for these programs, most likely, but we have this sort of big unknown from the Inflation Reduction Act, which was a truly uh, uh, unprecedented investment in conservation focused on climate change outside of a farm bill. This shows that this is a budget authority, a multi-year appropriation, so it sits on top of, outside of, or as a separate funding stream from the baseline programs. And that means it's not in the baseline, but it does have that, that additional set of funding there that um, obviously will, will draw a lot of attention. And the next slide shows the most recent uh, spend out estimates from CBO. So the other, the other issue with this in our, in our really heavy budget focused farm bill debate is how CBO treats this. So we know Congress there in the, the tall bars through 2026, that's the, the direct appropriation in the Inflation Reduction Act and then the shorter uh, solid bars is what CBO is currently estimating those outlays to be over time. And, you know, not to get us lost in this, but it, it is the outlays that matter in a scoring process in a farm bill from CBO. What does CBO estimate the program to cost in terms of outlays? How do you offset those things in terms of outlays? And you got to look at 10-year budget windows. And so, you know, a billion dollars in one year can equal $10 billion very quickly when CBO gets around to scoring it. So, Again, not to get us lost in the numbers, it is just really the takeaway here is just how important everything uh, from the Congressional Budget Office and everything in this budget space becomes to how we write programs, how the policy gets designed. Uh, so we're going to be watching that very closely, and I'm sure that'll be a topic of much discussion. Um, but I'm going to toss it back over to Chris to, uh, to talk a little bit about some of the challenges, issues, and opportunities we see. Well, Jonathan, clearly uh, we're setting up some good questions here for that marginal difference between um, authority and outlays. So somebody can some throw that at us when we're all done. But um, so when Jonathan and I were putting together this uh, bit of a blue sky paper on what it could be a revolutionary farm bill, as he mentioned, climate change was kind of our overarching theme that we were thinking about. Uh, clearly, there can be other things that uh, drive overall policymaking, but but it, it's 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 an issue that is sticking um, first and foremost for a lot of folks in the value chain, whether you're a farmer on the ground, whether you're a consumer, or whether you're one of the many um, in-between input companies or processors uh, there. So but the Inflation Reduction Act took a very massive swing at um, providing more budget for climate outcomes through the conservation program. Uh, that budget authority is there, uh, how USDA ultimately implements it, how it gets out on the ground. And these are all things that um, with or without a farm bill, we'll be able to um, participate in it, we'll be able to judge it, we'll be able to see how things are administrative. But there is this opportunity in the farm bill to perhaps iron out some of the policies to better spend that money uh, is one frame. So for example, in the Inflation Reduction Act, it is what they call a reconciliation bill. So uh, Jonathan can, can probably explain this better than I can, but, but in those processes, congressional lawmakers, policymakers are limited in how, what kind of language they can put behind that reconciliation number. So the quick explanation is there isn't a lot of new policy. Um, frankly, there shouldn't be any new policy according to reconciliation rules behind those budget numbers. So while we have this brand new, massive, significant budget authority coming for climate change out of the Inflation Reduction Act, 
the, the farm bill really could build upon that and, and start to work on the policies, whether it's EQIP, whether it's uh, CRP, CSB, or some of the, some of the public private partnership programs that we think about in uh, Title II, how can we make those programs more apt to provide the impact that we're all uh, across the value chain seeking? So EQIP is, as we know, the biggest program out there. Uh, you can do a lot of different things with it. Um, as our paper uh, lays out, there is a shortage. There's a, a, a budget for the demand that we see across the country. Now, this is a bit of a two-sided story uh, or two sides to the story. One, and, and I've witnessed this over the last couple of years as I've worked with our, my food company on working in the supply chain, there's no quicker way to turn a farmer off of conservation than to get them in the equip line only to wait many, many months for an answer and then have it be denied due to not making the prioritization, not having enough budget. Uh, we have folks that are interested in doing the work and not enough budget to do it. So that's something the Inflation Reduction Act was trying to address. Um, there's a huge opportunity moving forward to meet that demand. On the other side of the equation, the other story that I'm uh, referring to is the impact. Um, EQIP has a, a wide variety of options of things that can be done from everything from various crop management to infrastructure improvements across frankly, any type of farm system, whether it's especially crops, livestock, or, or various row crop systems. So huge opportunity here. However, EQIP doesn't necessarily, it, it does prioritize resource impact, but from a climate change standpoint, what the Inflation Reduction Act was trying to do was actually target it towards the most impactful types of practices. Um, actually, NRCS has a comment period open right now where they're seeking comment about how to measure and think about the most impactful climate smart practices for programs like EQIP. But this is likely going to be an ongoing debate and, and way of uh, how do we target or question about how we target EQIP overall. So the Farm Bill can certainly pick that up moving forward. I'll give you one example. Um, something EQIP is very good at is cost sharing one practice over the course of one year. But as we all know, many of these practices have multi-year, uh, they need, they have, these are multi-year management costs. So can we think about equip contracts that go more than one year, which you can do under law right now, but it is not often the common practice. And can we think about incentivizing multiple practices versus just one? So these are just some of the things that policymakers could try and incent more. Um, and moving to the second bullet, and I'm going to steal a line from a friend. Uh, uh, she knows who she is, but I, I don't need a proper footnote here. Often says this, you know, from a climate change standpoint, we're not likely going to cost share our way out of the problem. Um, so while EQIP is a fantastic opportunity to do a lot of good work, how do we think about public-private partnerships to fully scale, fully get across the work, not just to touch more farms and get more activities completed, but also to be able to measure and verify some of these outcomes from a climate change standpoint, which from a private sector standpoint is becoming a bigger and bigger uh, need overall. And something that frankly, the government is gonna have to work with the private sector on how to do that. And farms frankly aren't, you know, they're gonna need the help um, from various private sector partners to be able to do that work. So Regional Conservation Partnership Program or RCPP is the big uh, program here. Again, the Inflation Reduction Act allocated uh, significant new funds to that, but it's also a, still a relatively new program. This was codified in the 2014 Farm Bill, um, certainly from a, from a bias standpoint, something that I consider an innovation having worked on it, Jonathan, having worked on it back then. But 2018 bill made some improvements to that program to create uh, more flexibilities for non-federal partners to be innovative and think about different ways to engage farms across various uh, supply sheds or watersheds or whatever the geographical boundaries may be that a partner is interested in. So this is really an evolutionary approach. Public-private partnership is not a new concept, but how we do it, how we work with government, how non-federal partners actually implement on behalf of USDA, this is an evolution. And this is something that more and more models are being created, frankly, every year as to how to do this. So I expect that this, again, will have a, a probably a firm place in the next Farm Bill discussions. And then the third bullet, and I really should credit Jonathan for this, and Jonathan, you may want to jump in since this is his ongoing uh, set of ideation, but how do we leverage Title I and Title II? And, and I want to put, you know, draw this back to something Chuck said, um, you know, traditionally folks think of conservation compliance and mandates as ways to embed conservation uh, with Title I or crop insurance. Uh, this is actually, I think, something very different than that. This is more, again, an incentive-based structure using Title I uh, programs. Perhaps it's a bonus payment. Perhaps it's a way, you know, just changing the overall allocation 
through these programs, but we all know that they have scale across a huge amount of acres in this country. So the opportunity is pretty significant to drive more uh, impactful conservation outcomes via Title I. Jonathan, do you wanna jump in and say anything more to that? Well, I'll follow up with you in the next slide. We'll, 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 we'll dive into those points a little bit deeper. Um, but I think you, you're teeing up exactly the, the set of opportunities that should we think in a revolutionary sense, uh, they could be there. Absolutely, so next slide, please. So to Chris's point and to kind of segue into this. So when, when we thought about this and thought about the budget challenges, you know, you, you, you first kind of hit that wall on the baseline, but you step back for a minute and think, wait a minute, if we just looked at the potential and, and thinking through climate change in particular and working lands conservation in particular, as sort of this, the, the, the method or the mechanism by which we can help farmers deal with climate change, adapt, adjust, and help them sort of, um, you know, with the market opportunities that may come up around it. We step back and think about this, there's actually a lot of potential funding out here. Now, I want to caveat this, particularly to not get Chris in trouble, but this is just, you know, food for thought. This is not as if we are proposing, here's what we want to do, or here's what should change, or any of that. This is food for thought, particularly given the pressures on the budget uh, side of, of things. If you total up the spending in Title I and the Working Lands Conservation Programs, you get to more than $80 billion in a 10-year budget window that is available for thinking through revolutionary policy changes around climate change. That's even before you touch the additional $80 billion that's in crop insurance. So there is money out there. The challenge is how do we think through the policies? How do we think through designing or redesigning these to help farmers with climate change in all aspects of that, from the risks, from the need for re resiliency and adaptation to the potential market solutions. So to Chris's point in that previous one, look, these are, these are programs built around, in Title I, built around prices and yields. Can these same concepts uh, be built from Title II into Title I and vice versa? I mean, when we think about conservation and we think about conservation and climate in particular, we're talking about risk issues. When we think about private market type partnerships or solutions uh, in the climate space, we're talking about countercyclical market type policies. If we can create a price loss coverage program using the, the Chicago Board of Trade prices, we can think about price based assistance or adding in price based assistance uh, for climate change. There is nothing sacred that we have to use, you know, the, the, the 370 for corn built into the statute. We can think about providing farmers options. In fact, that's one of the big changes in the 2014 Farm Bill that was carried through in 2018. Farmers no longer were stuck with one program. They were provided options between the, the agriculture risk coverage revenue concept and the price loss coverage price concept. There is nothing preventing the ag committees and Congress from looking within that budgetary baseline and finding ways to innovate even within that kind of baseline set of challenges. Can a price-based uh, trigger in PLC provide options to the farmer or backstop uh, market potential around those prices? No. Uh, the USDA Climate Smart Commodities uh, pilot program kind of tees that up. Is there a way to think about the price loss coverage or agriculture risk coverage program that builds in the potential that a farmer might receive a higher price because those commodities have been produced in sustainable and climate smart manner. In which case you can backstop that that may also help the market uh, develop as well. You know, I also think a lot in terms of, of the revenue question, we hear a lot of, and, 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 and Mr. Thompson brought this up as well, the cost to the farmer. What I think is missing or has been missing in a lot of these conversations about uh, production costs and margin, there is a real cost to the farmer, as we know through EQIP and cost share programs, there's a real cost for the farmer adopting conservation programs and adapting their entire farm system around conservation concepts and climate change. There's costs, there's risks, there's management challenges. Those can also be built into these programs, not to force every farmer through it, but to provide options. This isn't compliance. This is a alternative pathway for those innovative farmers who want to compete in the climate space, we want to compete in the conservation and natural resource space. And what we can do is sort of backstop and build that so that they are not at a competitive disadvantage every step of the way as they innovate through this system. And so 
again, I come back to the, we can get stuck in the sort of pessimistic, oh, we've got this baseline. We can't, you know, we only got $30 billion for PLC. No, we have more than $80 billion sitting in this working land space that can be really innovatively worked together, coordinated and better, uh, better designed around what the farmer is going to need to see on the field level and what we as a society are pushing to, to get these adjustments and get this improvement and innovation around the climate change space, not just to create new markets, but frankly, to deal with the really substantial risk that we face in our food supply system. We need no uh, greater reminder than what happened during COVID. When climate change begins to further disrupt these things, how are we going to adjust? And one of the most important ways we're going to do that is through how we adjust and innovate in our policy space. So, again, I, I, I don't uh, I don't intend this for and Chris and I aren't trying to you know say wipe all this out and start over. But I think it's an important reminder that there's funding there and there's not just funding. There are mechanisms in which we can build this in. And so. Um, for those of you seeking some optimism in the discussion and, and, and have stumbled over the farm bill budget problem before, it's out there. And I think we can get, uh, we can get, get creative in this space. Um, Morgan, if you wanna jump to the next one, I think Chris has got uh, some more thoughts on, uh, on revolutionary concepts and this will take us into the SNAP discussion. So SNAP, not necessarily the first program you think about when thinking about solutions for climate change. And I just want to be very clear on this. I, I, we're not proposing necessarily that we need to be thinking about climate first when thinking about SNAP. But there are some interesting opportunities here, given, again, some of these uh, trends and motive, motivations we're seeing from different constituencies over the years. Uh, you know, the first bullet, I have to admit, we're being a little bit flip here. Um, it would be, you know, wave our magic wand. It'd be great to go back to a time of, say, 2008, when SNAP was a rel relatively bipartisan um, issue being solved within the, within the confines of Congress. Um, it's been a bit uh, contentious, as we all know, over the last couple of farm bills. Um, it, it likely will continue that way, given the budget that's at stake. Um, but that's obviously a, a whole nother issue. Um, so policy wise, however, there's there's I, th I think what we wanted to highlight here with the report and, and put some thought out for you all to to consider one of the bigger, in, in my view, in our view, uh, innovations, frankly, over the last decade is the idea of embedding incentives within the SNAP program. Now, this has had a couple different names over the years. It's currently known as the Gus Schumacher program. Um, so we wanted to think, you know, really, how does that incentive idea continue to build within farm bills? It's uh, the last two farm bills now, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, continued to evolve and actually embed itself with a permanent budget authority as well. So there's really opportunity here to maybe take this a step farther and think about how incentives can drive better nutritious options for more SNAP eligible uh, populations across the board. Um, there is, I, I put this the last bullet also as kind of a thought piece. It wasn't in the report necessarily, but it's come up in other areas of writing. But thinking about how government procurement uh, could drive healthier food options uh, for different, different populations, whether it be school lunch, whether it be uh, even frankly, just simple institutional um, procurement, whether it's just cafeterias within government buildings or whatever it may be, military, all big drivers, uh, purchasers of food. And we can think about, you know, using that as a tool to bring healthier and more sustainable options um, and sending that demand signal down to farms. But next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit more about the incentives piece. So again, uh, Gus Schumacher program, it was called, we had the acronym FINI, F-I-N-I, uh, back in 2014, but now called the Gus Schumacher program. And this is really developed and it will continue to develop because as I mentioned, it, there is permanent uh, budget authority in, in the current law. So when it comes up for debate in, 20, in this next year's Farm Bill discussions, it should have a pretty firm place in the debate. The question will be, are there any builds? Are there any evolutionary pieces that folks can take to this? Um, I will say, if you really want to go down a rabbit hole on how this program works and how it's being used on the ground, I uh, highly recommend going to the Fair Food Network website as just one really good source. You can kind of go through a map of the United States to see what these different projects look like. It's very dependent on local applicants for this uh, for these fundings from USDA to build out programs and incentivize healthy purchases within the SNAP program. So, for example, fresh driving uh, higher fresh fruit and vegetable consumption has been a big central goal of this program. Um, very similar to farm programs, there's been a, a, a very difficult debate about whether or not to mandate certain types of food purchases within SNAP. And, you know, should we limit 
uh, certain foods from the SNAP program. And that's been very contentious over the years. Uh, continue, I expect that actually will continue in some ways. So this incentive program is a way, frankly, to offer a third way and work around that debate and embed in the program incentives for consumers to find healthier options that make sense for their family. It's not a, a mandate on the consumer, but instead uh, an incentive-based option. Next slide, please. Actually, before we jump to the next one, Chris, I want to jump in that because this this goes as we were chewing over this idea of how to how to approach SNAP and and you, you know we may be thinking in revolutionary terms, but we're also not completely outside the the bounds of reality because the GusNet program, this incentives program, has funding directly from the uh, the Commodity Credit Corporation. And I apologize, this is the first Tuesday on campus, so we are having the air raid sirens in the background. <laughs> Um, but I think it's important to just note that, that while this would change or, or presents a potential big change, we've done this and we're funding this program now through the CCC, blending across, you know, our traditional siloed lines where CCC funding is only for farmers. Here we've been finding ways to, to redirect some of that funding, incentivize some of the healthy purchases instead of mandating or otherwise limiting benefits, really providing incentives and options. And to Chris's point, there's a lot of potential in a program the size of SNAP to incentivize um, the, the climate smart sort of supply chain, incentivize purchase. Because look, as we're seeing with inflation, when you have uh, families and individuals who are food insecure, these things hit them just so much worse than, than the rest of us. And so if climate change is gonna impact the, the food system, it's gonna hit uh, the SNAP constituency hardest, and it's going to hit them first. And so we are sort of an obligation to think about how do we really stand up and move things that can innovate, not just at the farm level, but also at that consumer level and help drive some of the market uh, incentives and choices and priorities around this. And so, again, not to not to over overplay it, but we have used some CCC funding to do this before. Are there more options out there to innovate in this space? Sorry, Chris, I didn't. No, I appreciate to highlight that. that. And, and you're you're actually spurring a couple other thoughts that I intended to throw out for for folks to think about. I mean, one is again, Fair Food Network has some great resources, as I'm sure USDA does, on the overall impact of this program, which is now eight years running. There is that farmer benefit side to this as well, right? Especially as as the program incentivizes. Uh, more purchases on local, regional fruit and vegetable. And frankly, it doesn't even have to be local fruit and vegetables, just fruit and vegetable in general purchases in most cases. So there is that direct farm benefit, you know, helping send that demand signal down to certain farms that are providing for this program. And what we've seen with this program is it's really expanded beyond, you know, it's not just a farmer market program. It is a retailer program uh, by and large, and we're seeing that expansion uh, really grow. The second thing I'll throw out there, again, this idea of, of, of embedding sustainability or climate outcomes within a nutrition program, it is a little innovative. It is a little edgy. And, and, and there's obviously an honest debate here about is that the sole purpose of SNAP? And certainly it's not. It's nutrition first. But there's some, there's some precedent for this. Um, if we actually explore the WIC program, Women, Infants, Children program, which is not a part of Farm Bill, I'll just throw this one nugget out for thought. Um, in the baby food aisle, if anybody, and I have young kids, so I've, I've been a purchaser of baby food over the last couple of years. But when you go down that part of the aisle, there's very, there's fewer and fewer options that are not organic certified. Consumers want organic certified baby food by and large. That is the trend over the last 10 years that, that it, part of industry has seen significant growth. So if you're a WIC mom purchasing baby food and that organic certified baby food is not WIC eligible, you've now limited that consumer's options quite a bit. So it's been, now there is no specific policy within WIC in law or in regs that says organic shall be included. That's that's not a thing, but states can bring in those options based on their own um, uh, discretion. Now I won't get into the ins and outs of how the WIC program works. That's a whole nother uh, topic and, and, and discussion, but, but I just wanna provide that consumer insight you know, that there are folks on these programs who want a broader array of options for a variety of different reasons. And with Jonathan, I'll hand it to you on trade. Yeah, and, and this just kind of goes, I think, to our final, um, just the potential that trade uh, and, and our trade agreements and our, and our 
global supply chains around food and agricultural issues could also obviously play a big role. The challenge in a farm bill is that, that the ag committees do not have jurisdiction over much of our national trade policy. Um, and so, you know, big changes and things like tariffs and trade uh, agreements and all of that are not going to be a farm bill discussion. Where we do see the farm bill inter interact specifically with trade around is around foreign access uh, for agricultural commodities and food and market development. And so clearly this is another uh, chunk in the baseline that we don't typically you know, add into our big four buckets of mandatory funding, but there are mandatory dollars in there that can be used or that can, again, be a space for innovating about how we develop markets for American farmers to compete on the global stage in a climate smart way. And I think we can all, uh, you know, craft our slick marketing talk, talking points and our, and our arguments around, you know, sustainably produced soybeans in, in the United States of America being shipped around the world versus, you know, soybeans in other parts of the world in which, uh, you know, land may be being converted from forests or, or other natural habitat to be farmed. And so here again, we've got some opportunities to innovate. We've got a, a chance to help build a global market to Chris's point exactly, where consumers around the world want to see their food produced sustainably, and they they are concerned about what climate change may bring. And so we, we've got some opportunities there as well. Um, and I think that's our la next to last slide. Morgan, we got one more. I think, uh, Chris, you want to close this out and we'll, we'll, we'll jump over to questions. Yeah, just some thoughts on next steps here. I mean, what would be revolutionary or practical? And back to uh, you know, my comment preceding this is I don't know that we need to judge the whole farm bill necessarily um, as, as revolutionary or, or status quo. But again, let's think about some of those individual opportunities based on the trends we're seeing. And we may see some really uh, important opportunities arise in the 2023 debate. With that, maybe we can open up some questions. Very good. Well, thank you, uh, Jonathan and Chris, for uh, for your comments and for, and for your uh, time, your thoughts on that presentation. And, and we will indeed open things up to questions and we'll bring Chuck back into the fold here as well. Would encourage all of you as you're watching along to please continue to submit uh, questions through that Q&A function. Uh, I, I see we've got a few in there already and we'll hope to get through those. We've got through about the top of the hour here uh, with our panelists. And so I'm looking forward to hearing their thoughts and, and on, on a number of subjects. And I'm going to take kind of moderator's prerogative and, and take the first couple of questions here. And I want to frame up our conversation uh, with, with this one. Um, I, I mentioned my, my initial farm bill experience at the top of my comments at this call. Uh, I will say this will be farm bill number uh, number three for me covering in a professional capacity. Uh, so I, I want to go around the circle. Uh, and, and Jonathan, this will be farm bill number what for you? Let's see, 08, 14, 18, this will be number four. Okay, Chris. Same here, number four. Okay, and Chuck? Uh, number nine, Spencer. Okay, I, I I promise I did not ask that just to just to hear that number, Chuck. I, I promise you that, but I but I do think it's important for. I was not here during the Forty Nine Act, but I've been around. <laughs> right. now, now, Spencer, now I need to amend my answer. Jonathan, I fourteen bills at least two bills, so yeah, get some plus <laughs> one. and maybe uh, yeah, maybe maybe an extra half there. Right. Um, but but no, I I think it's important for for the viewers of this panel to know kind of the context and the experience that you're all bringing to to this uh, to this discussion, uh, and specifically with this upcoming farm bill, uh, I, I do want to go first to uh, to the report that you uh that Jonathan and Chris uh, put together um I think there's an obvious you know question or caveat that needs to be asked that was something uh that you all rolled out in September of 22 obviously two months before the midterm elections uh two months before you know at, at that point uh the concept of a Republican House and the Democratic Senate would not have been a crazy assumption uh but the exact numbers uh were were not known and I guess technically still aren't known we got to watch what the state of Georgia is going to do here today but uh wondering what you think the prospects of the potential for that potentially revolutionary farm bill look like now that we know what the, uh, the what the split in the House of Representatives is going to be and have a, a much better idea of what the uh, prospect will be in the Senate. Jonathan, I'll go to you first on this. I'll just dive head first into the political uh, quicksand. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I, so first and foremost, any revolutionary farm bill is going to be difficult. I mean, we've seen that uh, in those few episodes we had uh, going through. So 
the likelihood that major changes happen, always a big uphill climb. I think given what we've seen, particularly the last two farm bills, when you know 2014 was a split House, Senate, with the administration sided with the Senate. So that's we're in that kind of scenario again. I, I think it's it's very difficult to kind of find all the way the pieces can be put together for anything too revolutionary. Now, the flip side of that is in some of these high pressure, most intense sort of efforts is, or when opportunities open that we, we can't see today, that we don't know today. Um, what I've been kind of saying around this topic is, is, is you're, we're watching for a couple like lead indicators, uh, things like the debt ceiling. Does that get taken care of in the lame ducks that we're not fighting about that for however many months? And then does the incoming leadership in the House in particular focus their caucus on cutting spending? What we've seen in the last two farm bills have been defeats on the House floor because we've gone after the SNAP program in a budget focus, not just budget focus, but a how do we cut spending? How do we cut spending? How do we cut spending? And it's all based on those bottom line numbers. And that coalitional, uh, that, that, that coalition that we need to get through the chambers just dissipates and falls apart. And, and I sort of remind people that even though SNAP gets all the attention, those who are most adamant about cutting spending in a farm bill don't want to stop at SNAP. They want it all eliminated. Title I, crop insurance, conservation, much of that gets pulled into the same debate. So to me, the big markers are that. If we're in this budget-focused kind of thing, then Chris and I start to have nightmares and flashbacks of what happened in 2011 when the debt ceiling upended our, all of our farm bill strategies in 2011 uh, and led us into that three-year process. Chris, your thoughts? Yeah, I'd like to go back a step before thinking about the current structure of Congress. I mean, number one, Jonathan and I were finishing this report as the Inflation Reduction Act was was surprisingly, frankly, uh, passing into law. So I think, you know, in hindsight, I would love to a couple more weeks to actually build that in better and think about what does that mean for a future farm bill? Because there were so many significant changes to the budget, especially through conservation there. So uh, the other thing I'll throw out is, you know, again, I, I, I'd like to think about it first and foremost. What are the needs, right? What are the problems that need to be solved? What are the drivers that are people, constituents, lobbyists, others are going to bring to the table for this farm bill? Um, and then overlap that with what is the makeup of Congress and, and how does the Congress receive, right, those different um, solutions that people are out there proposing? Because if there aren't significant needs, then we're obviously that first and foremost will lead to a very uh, status quo farm bill. Uh, the third thing I'll put out maybe is just a note for optimism. Uh, if we think about the last couple of farm bills, and I'm sure I'm going to I'm going to fudge these numbers because I don't have the exact uh, off memory, but if we just look at the Senate vote, sorry, I'm a, I'm a former Senate staffer, so I'm going to I'm going to take the Senate angle here. Um, but the last couple Senate votes were, I think, for, from 14 to 18, we saw a higher vote tally for the farm bill. I think we went from roughly 67 or so votes, 68 votes in 2014. I should remember that uh, to roughly 80 or so votes in, in 2018. And in a very divided Congress and a very uh, partisan time, that's a significant, significant uh, fact to think about. And so I don't know if that can be replicated necessarily, but I think that's certainly something that can be built off within the current Senate dynamic. Yeah, and I, I guess, Chuck, I'd be interested in your thoughts on, on that as well. Knowing what we know now about the uh, makeup of Congress, what do you think the, the, the farm bill temperature and the appetite for a revolution, I suppose, uh, might be one way to put it, is going to be? Yeah, I appreciate the question, Spencer. I, you know, I, this is an issue, Jonathan and Chris are very schooled, uh, knowledgeable people on this, and I, I wouldn't argue with them too much, but my, my gut instinct from a lot of farm bill experience says you can't look at the current divisions that we have in Congress, where, as you've described, we don't even know the final outcome of the Senate yet. And, and you know, there could be all kinds of leadership challenges and leadership changes in the House as a result of that. That's not conducive to writing a, a uh, you know, a, any legislation, uh, let alone a, uh, you know, a 12 title farm bill. And so, you know, the, the fallback that Congress always goes to when things are very, very sticky is sort of the status quo. And, and so you, you in, in my view, we have increased the chances of the status quo um, as a result of the, the, the political circumstance that the people have put in place here uh, several weeks ago. And that's well, just my instinct. 
Well, and Chuck, you had said uh, here today, and you said a couple of times previously that you expect this to be a very climate forward piece of legislation. How do you think the Republicans being in control of the House influences how climate forward this bill will be? Well, I think the the, the question on that, Spencer, is, is G.T. Thompson, uh, and I, I think the people uh, you know below him on the agriculture committees, they're going to, going to want to know what the farmers think uh, about this climate legislation. And that's why the, the Food and Ag Climate Alliance that I've been involved in, that includes a lot of environmental groups and forestry and everybody else has, has basically taken the fundamental approach of whatever we do here, uh, it's got to be fully supported by a very, very broad section of what I call producing uh, American agriculture, you know, the farmers and ranchers and producers doing the real work out there. And I think, you know, I, I think we've got an opportunity to do that. Um, I don't know that, uh, you know, the notion of incorporating all of the Title I payments as part of this sort of one big conservation package, I'm not sure we're in that kind of environment, Jonathan and Chris, you know, what, that it's open to debate. Uh, but certainly with the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, we've got 20 to $21 billion of new resources. By the time we write this bill, that number will probably be still 18 or 19 billion of new resources for climate. I think that gives, uh, you know, Republicans and Democrats a lot of flexibility here to work this. And, you know, we, we've never had those kind of resources available in the conservation title. And there may be some challenges to how that money is allocated or reallocated, if you will. But generally speaking, I think that affords us the opportunity that even in a so-called more status quo focused farm bill, we can have we can be pretty uh, forward leaning in the climate space. Yeah, go, go ahead, Jonathan. It looks like you have looks like you have. Oh a no! I, <clears throat> well, I just I think Chuck makes absolutely good points. I, I think we're staring at status quo, if not extension, at, at best given the scenarios we see before us. But I did want to just sort of jump in on that point and, and, and not to argue with you, but, but I do think there is, there is an argument here. And again, I'm not, first off, these were food for thought. We're not suggesting we wipe these things out and start over. But we hear time and time again in these debates that farmers do not want a one-size-all fits policy. Well, a fixed price in a statute is a one-size-all fits policy. And I think if we really want to take that, that signal from the farmers themselves, when we can build in alternatives or options to the farmers in these programs and let the innovators compete, let them go after it and do what they want. It's not one size fits all. It gives them a shot to do it. And I think, but I think you're right. We're, you're, you're, we're not going to sort of shoehorn a climate change. And I, I don't want to leave that impression that we shoehorn a climate change sort of set of policies across the entire space. I, I want to stress that I think what, what we're talking about is really the option at the farm level. And if you want to go chase the climate market, here's a backstop to help you do so to make sure that as particularly as something like that develops, you're not left in the wind when when things get a little tough. So I did want to just kind of clarify that point a little bit. But I agree with that. You know, other than that, I agree with Chuck. I mean, we're we're going to have a, it's going to be an uphill climb just getting getting the status quo through. Well, and if I can offer a, a shameless uh, plug here for uh, for one of my own programs, uh, we had uh, Jonathan on AgriPulse Newsmakers this last week, and I want to follow up on on a conversation that you and I had on that program uh, last week, Jonathan, uh, specifically about this Inflation Reduction Act funding, uh, that twenty billion dollars, and and what it means for for the Farm Bill baseline. Well, you know, one of the things that we had talked about on that program was whether or not that money can just be rerouted uh, into the Farm Bill baseline. And uh, if if I'm if I'm summarizing your comments incorrectly. Uh, please, please advise. But basically your thoughts at the time was you're not really sure. And, and folks really aren't at this point, I guess. Can you walk, walk us as an audience through what will need to be known to make that determination? Yeah. And it's, I mean, we're, we're at the whims of the congressional budget office. And that's when I say, we don't know it, it so much depends on how they're going to score. So, and again, this can get you, can get me in trouble, but, and Chuck made this point. It's a roughly, if you look at the outlay schedule that they put out in September, it's about $16 billion just in the EQIP, CSP, ASEP, and RCPP additional funding. So they've got $16 billion built out over to 2031 as outlays. Typically, when we go through these, these sort of 
strange machinations of scoring new programs. Let's say I create a new program that costs eight. I can go and rescind or cut or, or, or you know, eliminate that spending or some portion of it, which would then offset the additional spending. Now I got to do it over a 10 year budget window because CBO scores it one, five and 10 years. But largely the simple way to think about it is we're talking about uh, cutting it as an offset. But I want to also, uh, you know, highlight something Chuck mentioned. That's not free money. And that is not money that doesn't have expectations and support built around it. So it isn't as if uh, this is that, you know, magic pot of money, like say in 2002, when, when, the, when the committees were able to negotiate an additional chunk to the baseline, this would, would require eliminating some of the provisions from the, from, from, or some of the spending from the, the Inflation Reduction Act as an offset because we increased spending somewhere else. That's my best guess of how we would do it. But again, so much is going to depend on how CBO estimates, you know, when that money is spent, where it's spent, and how a change here would change the outlay expectations and what it would cost in, in, the, in the offset side of it. And I hope that's not too, I don't know, Chris or Chuck maybe can clean that up and make more sense out of it. I, I still circle in my own head a, a lot about how this is going to work. Jonathan, I might just add to, to your point, and I think you put up a slide that showed the conservation funding, you know, over a 10 year scale here. And I think one of our real challenges is those resources from the Inflation Reduction Act have a sort of cliff associated with them. And I think it's maybe year five, but you, you've probably got that data better than I do. And, and certainly from a long term food and farm policy standpoint, I don't think we're going to get by with, you know, sort of having a funding cliff of, you know, we're going to really invest in climate smart agriculture for a few years, and then all that money is going to go away. Uh, we, we've got to, we got to deal with that. And that's a real challenge in terms of those out year numbers and how CBO scores all of that. Well, while we're talking about CBO scoring, uh, Chris, you backed yourself into a corner during our, uh, during your presentation, talking about uh, how you were setting yourself up for questions on the differences between outlays and authority. Uh, and, and I wonder if it, I'll throw that question your way now, maybe if there's some folks that are, uh, you know, maybe uh, not necessarily CBO exports, uh, experts, maybe uh, farm policy rookies. What What is the best explanation that you can give for that difference there between CBO outlays and CBO authorities and, and why that's relevant? into this farm bill conversation well actually i have a lot of questions that i don't have answers for myself when looking at that slide so a little bit of speculation here uh on all fronts jonathan may know a bit more i have not engaged cbo i have not read the report so i i don't know but there cbo always has this challenge of anticipating what can actually get executed and put out on the ground right i think that's the general question that they ask themselves and then you know they 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 have their assumptions built into those uh, projections now we can debate those projections or assumptions um, we can provide new assumptions. I think that that can happen within Congress, but that's obviously up to the committees and, you know, the Ag Committee, the Budget Committee and others that can take different assumptions to CBO to potentially change that. Jonathan, I, I don't, I mean, there's some pretty stark gaps there. So I, I don't know fully what all those assumptions are, or frankly, if the, and they could change, right? If, if USDA takes actions uh, over the next year, that could potentially lead to changes as well. So I don't think that's a static uh, analysis that that could be a very dynamic analysis. Well, and, and plus we have seen the Congressional Budget Office have a real impact on the final policy that we see in the bill. Uh, I, I know for the example that comes to mind first for me is the dairy policy that was uh, originally proposed in the 2014 Farm Bill. Uh, I'm sure there's probably still some nightmares that uh, th that I'm triggering right now amongst the the two folks that were on the Hill for, for that piece of legislation. Uh, but but Jonathan, I guess just following up on, on Chris's comments there, I mean, how, how would you best uh, help folks better understand the, the role of the Congressional Budget Office here in, in the upcoming farm bill yeah i i uh i have nothing to argue with chris about and i i think it is a bit of a mystery and and that kind of leads to your question which is a, is a great one and one that is a reminder the cbo is is a mechanism you know that these are nonpartisan, non-affiliated they're incredibly good at what they do it is it is a group of people you know we pick on them a lot particularly at the staff level we i, I can't believe the number of late night calls we had he would have a CBO and that they would even answer the phone some of the time as we tried to sort through these questions. So they do an incredible job. It is incredibly difficult because they are forecasting an unknown future with all kinds of numbers. So it is that. 
And I think we always have to remember, you know, people, we want to pick on CBO a little bit. It is the best educated economic forecast and analysis of an unknown future. And so they're just trying to give Congress that information to work with. That being said, uh, we know, and I, I, I get to spend my days arguing with economists here on campus. You know, they are economists and, and a lot of what they do, those forecasts are built on assumptions. So Chris is exactly right. If they assume that, that EQIP is only going to spend out at a slower rate, then that assumption carries and that's what CBO says. And that's what, whether it does or not, that is what the program spends. And so we do have to keep that in mind that it's, it's forecasting that out and it's subject to change. Did I, hopefully I answered it. And Chris, maybe you got a better. Well, yeah, just two on. quick things to add. Just, I mean, the equip example, just take that one for, uh, you know, I have to assume that CBO is looking at the historical actions and the historical administrative infrastructure that USDA has in place. So they're looking at can, you know, NRCS through its 50 state office system actually get those dollars out on the ground. Uh, through the way that they do business now. So if, if NRCS made changes to how that system works, that could change CBO's overall assumptions down the road. And you know, just to put a finer point on the overall CBO system, while they do receive input from congressional staff and they're open to arguments, I mean, they're the arbiter at the end of the day. They're the referee, if you want to use a sports analogy. So they're setting the rules on what can be spent and what can't in the next, you know, is that dollar real and actually fungible or is it not? want to go to some questions being submitted now from the audience. I uh, encourage all of you to continue participating in this dialogue. I uh, want to kind of take a question uh, submitted by Joyce uh, Hunter into our Q&A and maybe broaden it out a little bit. Uh, she talks about, uh, you know, a kind of a lack of discussion amongst all of us here so far about the issue of cybersecurity and wondering whether or not uh, there's going to be a, an opportunity to comment on or possibly even recommend an additional section to the Farm Bill, uh, maybe a, a Title 13 uh, relating to uh, cyber th cybersecurity within agriculture. And I guess I'll, I'll broaden out that question a little bit, wondering, you know, we've got this current 12 title structure, uh, you know, Chuck showed that, uh, you know, showed that slide as part of his presentation. Do you anticipate any tweaking uh, within within those titles, be it uh, cybersecurity, as was suggested? Uh, we've seen a livestock title in the past. Uh, some folks have bantied about the idea of a climate change title in, in this upcoming farm bill. Do you see anything like that happening? Uh, and, and I'll open that question up to whoever wants to dive into it first. There's always the miscellaneous title. Um, I, I don't know enough to speak on cybersecurity. I, I'm not going to speculate on what the right policy is or, or what the need is there. I certainly worry about it myself as a consumer every time I'm online, but um, and I know everybody else does too. In terms of the farm bill, you know, one thing to think about, um, uh, you know, and this isn't often the the thing that constituents will think about when they're posing the problem that needs a solution, but does the Ag Committee actually have jurisdiction over that issue? And you know how it impacts farmers and how it impacts uh, the food system, it, it becomes a jurisdictional question. And so it can be, that can actually be a barrier to the committee actually thinking about those solutions. Um, other committees can get involved and, and pose ideas, but, but that's, you know, there are challenges with that, both on the House side having its own joint jurisdiction rules and then the Senate um, a little more informal on the jurisdiction, but but nonetheless, it's very difficult to insert a non-jurisdictional issue in the committee product. So it just becomes a barrier to the overall conversation. And I would assume, and I could be wrong, but maybe you can make an argument for Ag Committee jurisdiction, but it probably is going to fit more in the judiciary realm or the homeland security realm of government. So it just jurisdictional issues do matter at, at some point. In Chuck, I guess your, your thoughts on the general framework of the, the current 12 title farm bill and whether or not that's uh, that's apt for changes. Um, on, on, I'll, I'll get to that, Spencer. I'll just say on cyber security, my members have, have been subject to a lot of ransomware attacks um, in the last you know couple of years. And so this is certainly high on, on their thought process. I, I agree with everything. You know, Chris said this is a challenging fit in a farm bill. Um, you know, we do have a title on research uh, and extension. And, and at most, I would probably see some extension related 
programs designed to educate probably uh, in this space, not a new title, certainly. Um, you know, the, the early farm bills that I worked on um, had fewer titles than what we have today. And then, then we went through a season where some of the farm bills had more than what we have today. And we've sort of settled on this, you know, around 12. My, my sense is, Spencer, that if we tried to add new titles, um, my gut instinct tells me that that would be associated with increasing the size of the farm bill, if you will, regardless of maybe what is being spent on the total package. And I just see that being a heavy slog for G.T. Thompson and all these uh, uh, firecracker members of the, 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 the new House leadership going on. So um, I, I, I think that's going to be a heavy lift, is, is my gut instinct. Very good. Uh, also, I had a question submitted from from Del Craig, and it kind of dovetails off of what we were uh, discussing earlier uh, in relation to the uh, the spending uh, from that Inflation Reduc Reduction Act. Uh, Dell is wondering uh, whether or not a, a new, more conservative Congress uh, has the uh, authority to maybe reverse the previously approved spending from that IRA and redirect it away from, uh, you know, away from perhaps. Um, climate smart programs. I guess the well, I, I know I've got three seasoned uh, foreign policy veterans here. What's uh, uh, what, what would you all say is kind of the simplest explanation for for what that process might look like? It's always about the last law written. If the dollar isn't spent, it's about the last uh, last law written. So you know, Congress, yeah, John, then you should take this one. No, no, I, I I'm just agreeing with you. The um, I will say something that you did tee up earlier. The Inflation Reduction Act was 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 worked through the process under special budget rules for reconciliation. So one of the things that would be challenging is reconciliation requires both chambers to agree on the budget, the budget instructions to do so. And so you're not going to, you know, the fastest path or or the least uh, rules based kind of, you know, filibuster and all that all that work is the reconciliation process because it allows for the 50, you know, the bare majorities to get through, but it does limit a lot of things. So certainly a Congress, the next Congress could run a reconciliation in reverse, if you will, and cut all that down and get, and, you know, not spend it anywhere or take bigger cuts. But again, we've got to not just a split government, we've got to split Congress. And so that would require both the Senate Democratic majority and the House Republican majority to agree on what those budget parameters and numbers will be and what in and reconciliation, straight reconciliation instruction would look like. And then I got to pick on Chuck, one bit of history. The, first, the only climate change title in Farm Bill history was 1990. So it is possible to have a title, right? Wasn't it title 25? The 90 bill was, was, was like 25 or 27 titles. But I think you're right. I mean, all of that comes with expectations of adding spending. So it's not like it's, <laughs> you're not writing just an easy, uh, an easily new, new title. New title. I, I, you know, it's probably, it's probably easier than adding dollars, but, but still, still tough. I, I, I'm just trying to imagine a, a, a markup process with, uh, with 20 plus titles. Um, I mean, I, 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 I frankly, there, I, that's that's really going to challenge the, the the liquor stocks and the uh, various budget off or the various uh, offices on Capitol Hill, and I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, <laughs> certainly, a a very very different uh, different scenario than what we have now. Uh, question submitted, uh, more more of a comment, I suppose, submitted by uh, by uh, Richard Wilkins, uh, and he and I wonder if we can just have a discussion about this, maybe outside of a farm bill context, and more in the general climate uh, legislation uh, and a challenge that is faced. Uh, lawmakers as they write bills like this, and Richard kind of mentioned mentions his concerns with the uh, competitive process for for climate smart agriculture and whether or not it has it has the potential to reward as as he puts it uh, creatively worded uh, project grant proposals uh, and, and farmers and, and organizations who might have a better idea of how to you know write their proposals as opposed to maybe the on the ground implementation where you know perhaps their practice changes might uh, might offer a better framework uh, you know that's probably as much as an implementation and administration question as it is a legislative one but 
but I guess Chuck, your thoughts on on how how Congress and and maybe even how the department can can address this issue, uh, not only through you know the upcoming farm bill and some of the programs that might be created there, but also as you know we await uh, the announcement of the second round of funding under the Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities, uh, a number of projects that will be funded uh, once uh, once we see that announcement as well. Well, um, I think it's a, um, Spencer, it's a great question that uh, Richard has put forward. He's a real progressive farmer here on the East Coast and uh, um, does things really, really well on his farm. I, I think it's probably something we do need to focus more on on the delivery side of this. We do have a tendency to put uh, a lot of emphasis on the programs. But, but you know, there, there's a, a delivery component here, and particularly, um, I think Chris mentioned it as well, but, you know, that, I, I'm not sure we can stand here and pound the table and say we have had the absolute most equitable distribution uh, system for um, payments in the past. And, and I, I suspect this is an area where, where there's going to be a lot of testimony as Congress really dives into the Farm Bill and in conservation, in, the, in, in Title II conservation uh, on this, this topic. And, uh, I, I would probably encourage him to do that because I think that we can probably do a better job there. And it's a great question, Richard. Yeah, and Chuck, I will just flag. I don't know if you've uh, maybe done something different on your mic setup in the last uh, ten minutes or so, but we're starting to get some kind of some interference on on your end. We can still hear you, but it, uh, yeah, ironically enough, it was when we started talking about cybersecurity, kind of some robot uh, voice uh, inflection kind of came through your line. So, I, I, I who if, if somebody's pulling a prank on his line, uh, well done. But uh, I, I don't know if something different can be done from the setup standpoint there. Uh, but I, I guess, Chris, your your thoughts sort of from the sort of the marriage there of the uh, the legislation uh, drafting to the to the administration implementation and how that might work on the um, on the climate smart uh, efforts that we're seeing both from Congress and the administration. Yeah, and I, I think this is an issue that that is far broader than climate, um, frankly. I mean, this this really almost any government program. I mean, there's administrative, I mean, how easy is it for a constituent or for any interested party, right, to access these programs? I mean, that's the general question. And then how do you balance that with, did that application, which received some rigor and vetting and approved, did it get the impact that was intended by the program, right? So there's two ends. It's the front end. You know, how how are we allowing people to apply for these dollars? And, and what is the rigor that's required? Um, it can be a high transaction cost, whether you're an individual farmer going through EQIP or whether you're a uh, uh, a, a private company going through RCPP or a nonprofit going through RCPP, these are high transaction cost uh, applications in a lot of sense. And so it can deter people from even wanting uh, to go in. It can create a lot of frustration when people are denied or said no to. Um, and, and then, but then on the other hand, we've, you know, Congress and, and the, uh, and, and constituencies are going to demand impacts, right? For the, people are going to want to see that these dollars spent are actually going towards what they were intended. So there's an interesting balance here on both the front end and the back end, and it's not easy. Um, I think it requires content. And I think USDA has done this over the years. Uh, there's a tinkering that, that goes into the administration of these programs. And that's not to say we have it right. Um, I, I can tell you, you know, just in the past couple of years of working with EQIP, there are some states that do it really well, and there are some states that, that are a little more challenging. Um, so just within the NRCS system, that can be sometimes, um, and that, that isn't often, um, writing a statute in a farm bill, it's very difficult to address that sort of challenge in a, in a farm bill. Chuck, a, a question submitted by uh, Ralph Grassi specifically for you, and I suppose probably borrowing on your experience working with uh, a number of the specialty crops and specialty commodities under uh, under NCFC's uh, portfolio. Uh, Ralph's wondering uh, whether or not you envisioned continued expansion of crops eligible for uh, insurance, and uh, if you expect compliance uh, to be a bigger factor in in the insurance program. Great question, Ralph. It's good to hear from you. Um, Certainly, I do expect uh, um, crop insurance to continue to expand their their you know, number of commodities that they're servicing. Uh, Jonathan can probably bail me out and tell me how many are out there, but now, but it's 
you know, it, it's a lot of commodities uh, to the tune of hundreds. And so we, we have expanded that coverage really, you know, dramatically out there from uh, the early days uh, of the program. And that's a good thing. I mean, it, it is the risk management tool in the farm bill today. And I think we would all, you know, acknowledge that could be the case. In terms of uh, compliance, you know, I, I boy, I think you're going to have a hard time stepping away from the insurance aspect of this and, and adding on any sort of additional requirements of saying, you know, you must have crop insurance and by having that crop insurance, you're going to, you're, you're going to do A, B, and C. Um, I know we're doing that a little bit, but um, I, I'm just not sure we're ready to take any, you know, any further steps down that sort of cross compliance direction. Again, given the fact that crop insurance has become really the, the general risk management tool across the country for virtually all producers today. Well, and, and Jonathan, let's let's ask you to put your uh, your your farm bill and USDA historian hat on for for a, for a moment here. What does the current kind of breadth and depth of uh, of commodities within crop insurance look like, and how have we seen that change uh, in, in recent decades? Yeah, and Chuck's absolutely. Right. I had no idea how many commodities are in that. I mean, it is it has grown a lot, and I actually think that's one of um, just the great values of that program. It's a risk management tool for farmer. Again, farmers have options, ranges of of insurance policies they can buy. They've got add-ons and, and, and private market solutions and endorsements and all kinds of things that I think have been really valuable to the farmer and to the program's operation and how it's grown. And, and I think one of the great trends in the last few farm bills has been you know, encouraging and pushing more crops for more farmers, particularly fruits and vegetables, specialty crops, where we do have a lot of challenges without that kind of big transparent market like the Board of Trade kind of thing that keep base prices off of, but their risks are, are phenomenal. I mean, this is a program that started in 38, 1938 as just for wheat. And so it, it has certainly grown substantially over time, but none, I mean, most of that growth has all happened since 2000. And the way we, we provide the premium assistance, the way we help farmers buy the program, the way we work with a you know, private partner private public partnership with the industry to deliver that to farmers to adjust those losses at the farm field level. Those are all really valuable, not just in the policy, but maybe even as again, lessons as we think about how do we ad adapt and adjust and innovate in policies around the world, you know, around the, the entire farm bill space. This is what, what farmers are voting with their feet, with their pocketbooks around crop insurance. They like those options. They like the innovation we can see there. So it gives us quite a bit to work with um, and, and, and certainly uh, thinking this through in a risk management standpoint is, is critical, um, which really ties into something that, that Chuck also brought up around compliance, because that is such a tough topic. And, and I'm going to let Adamo handle any, any, anything too much further on compliance other than to point out, because what we are doing with crop insurance is risk, is it, is it helping with, with really un unpredictable, uh, un sort of planable, <laughs> you know, you can't really plan against when a drought's going to hit or what the weather's going to do. And it's that risk funk, that risk factor when you've sunk seeds in the ground, put that cost in up front and are waiting to get a crop out of it is where crop insurance comes in. And so the compliance mechanism gets really sticky and difficult in that scenario because, because of that set of unknowns and because what we're dealing with is risk and a risk pool, an insurance pool, in which if you push some farmers out, it's gonna adjust the way that whole thing operates. So as we're expanding it, as we're making it more accessible to more farmers, you know, is it is it of value to come back in and start limiting on one side or another of that? And I really do think, you know, we've seen all kinds of ideas around um, um, limits on payments and indemnities and premiums. We've seen all of this time and again, and Congress has pretty clearly rejected those time and again, and largely because I think a lot of people who work on the program understand that we're trying to help farmers manage risk. You know, pushing people out or limiting their options and abilities is not going to really benefit either the program or the farmer. It may get you, you know, a one-off CBO score that looks good, you know, to, to kind of hit that talking point, but it's not going to really help the program. Mm -hmm. It may, maybe just something to throw out on that topic um, to try and break the dynamic here or break the paradigm structure just around conservation compliance, because I think that's a 
That's a that's a difficult place to go for a number of reasons. But one trend we've seen, starting with a couple nuggets in the 14 bill and certainly again in the 18 bill, is how do we quantify risk for the purposes of RMA to consider things like conservation practices and various things that could potentially reduce that risk. That's a difficult thing to quantify. It's an effort that's begun to you know, build over the last uh, six to eight years, perhaps. And, and I don't think it's going to be solved in the short term. This is a long-term effort. You need, Jonathan, what is it, Chuck, 10 years of, of sound production history to create that actual really sound risk management policy. But as we start embedding that data collection um, on you know, things like cover crops and tillage and your basic soil health practices, how does that reduce risk so that we can actually embed those incentives in a crop insurance premium? I think that is clearly the long-term uh, trajectory. I don't know when we get there necessarily on that on that sort of policy. Um, in the short term, though, what I think we've seen at least two states, I think is it both Iowa and Illinois now that's starting to offer a bonus payment or a reduction in premium on crop insurance policies for the act of, of increased soil health practices such as cover crops. I think cover crops is the is the eligibility requirement. But but this is a clear direction on incentives versus prohibitions. Well, and while we're talking about cover crops, we did see in the Inflation Reduction Act and efforts to, uh, you know, add those $25 per acre payments on uh, for producers that, uh, you know, might uh, employ that practice. Um, you know, I guess, uh, Chris, do you envision a receptive political environment to, to, to an idea like that in a farm bill context? Well, I guess it all depends on what budget is available and 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 who wants to use that budget, first and foremost. Um, but I think the idea itself is 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 perhaps socializing. I, I don't know, I'll frankly, like how deeply or embedded this idea is getting out throughout different regions of the country. But just seeing it, you know, take place in a couple I states, um, for in particular for soy and corn production. I mean, that's a big move. I mean, those are big acreage areas uh, or, or crops for the country. And so as that that sort of policy starts to um, socialize and and get tested. Um, in those key areas, then I think the the maturity level of that idea increases for for Congress to consider. But remains to be seen whether it's it's ripe enough for um, you know expansion in 2023. Chuck, a, a question submitted by uh, James Callen, and I'm going to direct it to you first. But I probably want to hear from Jonathan on this as well. Uh, wondering uh, how the how uh, you all see the concept of increased reference prices uh, through through PLC uh, and that debate uh, shaping out. We've seen a number of uh, farm groups already submit policy uh, calling for increases, but uh, I, I'll say it before any of you can, we're in a really tight budget environment. So there, uh, I've taken that talking point away from you, but that in mind, uh, what, what do you kind of foresee as the, uh, the, the environments that those facing uh, or those calling for those increased prices are, are going to face uh, as, as they take that idea to Capitol Hill? I think Jim is setting me up uh, on this question, but um, in any event, I, you know, I, I will just tell you it's 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 going to be a tough talking point, and and you know, I what are we looking at? Uh, you know, three seventy, for example, I'll use corn as an example of three seventy, or and some change reference price on corn, and you know, the current market price is six thirty, maybe six forty, something like that. So you know we're we're not even in the same ballpark in terms of where we are price wise today in these reference prices and and every every commodity would sort of show that kind of gap if we went if we fell to reference prices and started triggering a payment you know we would really be in sort of an economic disaster if you will on the farms on farms today uh, maybe a, a better way of putting it and so you know the pressure to maybe make uh, these things a safety net versus a, you know, we're in crisis and our hair is on fire sort of uh, reference price is, is going to be strong out there. Spencer, you've identified it, though. I mean, even even though we may may not even predict those kind of low prices, our Congressional Budget Office under their um, Jonathan can can name it. There's a certain type of scoring they use where that increasing the reference price it increases the chances of payments triggering, and that's going to get reflected in their budget, and we, we would have to pay for that. Um, you know, I would say to the farmers and ranchers uh, listening across the country, it's kind of up to you, really, in terms of how you want these dollars allocated. You know, do you want some of your farm bill dollars going for this purpose, for higher reference prices, in order to have that more of a safety net to the commodity programs than what we have today, which is virtually no safety net? left. 
uh, and you know your your input uh, to those members of Congress that I put up on the screen during my presentation will be critical and fundamental to that. Well, Jonathan, interested in your your thoughts here as well, and I, and I was also hoping you could expand on something you brought up during your discussion about uh, the potential um, you know use or inclusion of Board of Trade uh, numbers in this conversation. Can you expand on that idea a little bit? Yeah, I, so at the risk of interge interjecting a little controversy into this, but a couple of things sort of jump out at me on this. And the reference price one is, uh, you know, just near and dear to my heart is one of my favorite topics. Because if we want to talk about equity and equitable payments, I mean, the reference price structure now is the furthest thing from that. And what we see are some crops with much more beneficial reference prices than others that trigger prices every year. And those crops tend to have smaller acres which is a big warning on this discussion about reference prices. The big acreage crops like corn and soybeans, to Chuck's point, the stochastic scoring mechanism that CBO uses means on 90 some million acres of corn, every little penny is a huge cost. So the smaller the crop, the easier it is to raise the reference price and lo and behold, we get this off balance, off kilter kind of payment scenario. So raising reference prices is not a simple, you know, we all see higher, market prices, but we're looking over 10 years of estimates. And each one of those is, is dealing with the acreage footprint of that crop, the base acreage footprint of that crop. So what is in the program? So what you end up seeing is we can raise reference prices for some crops really cheaply. cheaply. We cannot do so in corn and soybeans. I mean, I, it's, it's just a tough reality. You know, soybeans can push it up a little bit, but every chance you get closer to, the, to where those market prices are, CBO is going to estimate a cost over tens of millions of acres, not a million acres, like in some of the smaller crops, like peanuts, for example. So it is a problem in that equitable space. But I come back to, uh, or the sort of, you know, the, the balance amongst the interest in the, in, the, in the commodity discussion. But to that point about the commodity, the board of trade, this is where we could think about options and innovations that give farmers alternatives. So maybe you want to, you know, hit the, the sustainable, you know, markers somewhere in, in your production. And we can think about how your reference price could reflect that. Then you've got an option. Um, you know, we use board of trade as sort of the basic, but we're using a 12 month marketing year average of all farmers across. The country. So these are very much one size fits all kind of policy mechanisms. Everybody fits into the 370 corn space, no matter if you're selling, you know, a high uh, you know, identity preserved grain of corn, which the reference price doesn't recognize or reflect. So we can think about that, but I do think that this sort of blanket, let's just raise reference prices really plays out differently when we're stuck in this baseline CBO scoring scenario. And it ends up benefiting some crops and some farmers more than others. And it's almost always tied to the size of that acreage footprint and the base in the program. Well, Jonathan, while I got you talking, talking, I'm going to go to you with this question, but I would like to hear everyone's thoughts on it. Uh, going into the last Farm Bill process, especially kind of on the tail end of things like the market facilitation program and, and some of the payments that were that were observed there, uh, you know, we saw a lot of calls about whether or not the um, the Commodity Credit Corporation's uh, borrowing limit needed to be increased from the current $30 billion, uh, where it was set in the, in the late 1980s, uh, maybe uh, indexing that for inflation. Uh, I, I believe one piece of legislation I, I saw had the number somewhere in the $60 billion range. Uh, I'm wondering uh, your, uh, you know, I suppose uh, practically it's uh, uh, simply a measure of adding a, a line into the legislation, but politically, is, is this something that Congress is going to be able to tackle or frankly even want to tackle in, in the upcoming legislation, do you think? I have, let me caveat this. I have not seen CBO score this, so I don't know. It is a very easy legislative text, it's, you know, a number in the statute. But the likelihood that that's going to cost an enormous amount in a baseline estimate scenario is quite large. I mean, it's just the kind of thing that they're going to look at and say, oh, you're adding another, you know, add another 20 billion to the, the limit. Some amount of that's going to get spent out, and every year is it, or every time is a ten-year spend out, and so it is magnified ten times. So you, know, you can just, I don't know, do the math. You 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 add, you know, add add ten billion, you're adding a hundred billion very quickly. And the baseline scenarios just do not allow for it. So I don't see any, I don't see any functional way for the committees to do that, given what we what we deal with, um, what we deal with in in the scoring and and budget restrictions. But I also, I mean, MFP, uh, whether for good or ill, 
you know, demonstrated that the cap is itself, you know, it's, it's not a, uh, it's not a make or break thing. I mean, it's, it's really just what they can borrow at any one time and the appropriators effectively pay off the credit card. So if they had to pay off the credit card earlier, then the cap is itself not necessarily a total limiting factor. Now there's a lot that goes in. I don't want to, I don't want to make that sound as sort of uh, simple and, 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 you know, um, easy and whatnot. I mean, there's a lot of challenges to go into it, but it is just a limit on borrowing authority. It's not an actual limit on spending. So you can pay it back in what they call um, what is it, appropriation anomalies or something like that, that score that they, that they use. So Jonathan talks a lot about uh, kind of the scoring process there. Chris, can you walk us through some of the politics that, uh, that a request well, like that would face? Uh, Jonathan and Chuck, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the first thing that came to my mind when you asked that question was, well, what do the appropriators think? Um, the, the budget, the appropriation committees are probably going to have a very strong opinion on that sort of move. So even, even if, and I don't think this will happen, but if farm bill negotiators wanted to use their budget authority to do such a thing, there's going to be an impact on the annual appropriations, uh, process with that sort of, you know, more credit, as Jonathan said, more credit card potentially to pay off. And that sort of risk is probably something the appropriators I'm guessing don't want to take on, but, but maybe I'm not thinking about that correctly. That, I mean, I think that's going to be a, I, I used to get the knock on the door from the appropriators when we were thinking about crazy things. And so I, I do know that they will uh, touch base with the Ag Committee uh, from time to time. Well, and Chuck, I guess your your thoughts on kind of the, the line of thinking that we've had here so far, as well as I'd be curious, your thoughts um, as someone who, you know, worked on the Republican side of the aisle on Capitol Hill, how do you expect congressional Republicans to kind of react to the last couple of years that we've seen of CCC spending, particularly this Partnership for Com uh, Climate Smart Commodities program, how, how you expect that to influence uh, this conversation on Capitol Hill? Um, it's a great question, Spencer. Let, let me just say that I honestly, I don't think the CCC cap is going to be an issue for us. And I don't see the need, you know, that we're, we're going to need to take action to, to raise it or to pay down early or anything at this point. And I say that just because we have been through a season where, you know, the CCC has been used very, very liber lib liberally, <laughs> however, I'm, I'm trying to say that it's been easy to get CCC dollars for a variety of things. And Vilsack has really sort of pushed the envelope. And I, I, I commend the way he has convinced the lawyers over there that he has the authority to do a number of these things, because I was always told, no, you can't do that. But uh, he's found the secret sauce here. But having said that, I mean, the CCC during COVID has, has, you know, just really sort of been used heavily. I don't anticipate we're looking at, you know, anything of the sort going forward. And I just sort of see the, uh, the current limits being adequate to um, fund commodity programs in, in the, the times that we're in, honestly. And so um, appropriators, stay in your office for a while. You're not, uh, no, no need to get, you know, too worked up yet. Very good. Well, I tell you what, we are we are coming up toward the end of our question and answer time. And so I'm going to ask a, a quick question of uh, of everyone here before we conclude our dialogue. Uh, wonder uh, sometime in when we're all sitting together around a cup of coffee in, in 2030, uh, we will look back and say the biggest change in the 2023, 2024, 2025, the biggest change in the farm bill after the 2018 one was fill in the blank. And, and, and uh, Chuck, I'll go to you first. Well, again, Spencer, I think we've talked about a variety of things here in terms of the climate space, and I don't necessarily agree that, you know, we're going to go that direction on everything. But I, I have been saying and I continue to maintain that, that this bill will need to carry the label as the most climate friendly farm bill we've ever passed. And I think that will be how this bill is probably remembered. Chris, your thoughts? Yeah, I think we're going to see continued growth of public-private partnerships, whether it's in the conservation realm or in the nutrition realm, frankly, both. I think those are trends that uh, aren't going away, and, and we're going to continue to see the need for both private sector and public sector to be working together just to leverage each other's resources and know-how for no other reason. And Jonathan? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, I, I side with Chuck on this. I think we look back and five, 10, 20 years and see that the Inflation Reduction Act kind of set off a chain reaction of, of change around climate and helping farmers innovate and adapt and deal with the risks and challenges that are coming at them. 
which feeds our food system. And I, I'll be an optimist. You know, we're we're closing in on the holiday season. I'll be an optimist this moment to think that that that's that's the beginning of this shift, and we start to see the opportunities really grow from there. Well, gentlemen, to, to say this has been a fun conversation would be a drastic understatement on my part. This has been uh, really enjoyable, and, and I hope uh, I hope all of you and I hope all of our viewers uh, enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, great discussion about this next farm bill and the the obstacles facing it. Uh, I appreciate all of you taking the time to to join us and, and also to uh, join us via via this webcast. Uh, thanks again for for taking part, and, and I'll turn things back over to Tim. Thank you so much, Spencer, and thanks to uh, our speakers. Uh, Chris, Jonathan, Chuck, uh, you were remarkable. You know, just such candid and thoughtful insights uh, are absolutely priceless, uh, and uh, we really appreciate it. Just a reminder to uh, to look for Chris uh, and Jonathan's paper on our website. Um, and uh, if you uh, appreciate uh, enjoyed today's uh, session, please uh, fill out the brief survey that you're going to see at the end of this. And just a, one last reminder, this holiday season is uh, become a friend of Farm Foundation. It'll help us continue to provide the programming such as today's forum. And uh, each and every gift to Farm Foundation strengthens our ability to address rapidly evolving issues impacting agriculture, the food system, and rural communities. And we're very, very grateful for your support. Uh, happy holidays, and thank you again for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you next year.